Yo, what's up? This is Keese. Um, I have the pleasure of kind of taking the baton and running the second leg of this Last Dan series Pastor Kelly started last week. And for my portion, I want us to look at and examine the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 through about 29. But before we get into that, why don't we have a word of prayer? Father in heaven, I need your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit. Your word is living. And so if we allow your word to live in us, it promises to us eternal life. Let it be a wellspring of water flowing through and out of us. And God, as we look at this story, let it be more than just a story. Let it be more than theory and let it actually come alive and give us something practical for our lives. In Jesus name we pray, amen and amen. So I want to read for you a few verses. Um, it may get long, may not, but I want to kind of stop as we go through this and kind of just break down a couple of things that I see. Um, I want to talk to you today uh, from the second installment of our Last Dance series under the title Flashback. Flashback. Now, a flashback is used in um, a film and television to kind of go back and fill in crucial parts of a story. Something is happening and you kind of need to know why that's happening and why that's pertinent. So what the filmmaker would do is kind of stop and take you back using sepia tones or a little and kind of take you back and then fill in that blank. The other thing that it does is it also serves as, as a tool to kind of... Um, unravel a mystery, like in a mystery novel, when you're reading something, you get this flashback that kind of takes you back and fills in, ah, oh, that's why that was there, or that's why that was happening. And it's crazy because the Bible, being as old as it is, uses that exact strategy when telling the story of Herod who killed John the Baptist. And, and this is a very funny story, and funny not in the sense of that it makes me laugh, but it's funny that the Bible has a story like this in it where it contrasts or juxtaposes two characters, John and Herod, who couldn't be anything more, who couldn't be any more different, but are linked because of this story and a literal, listen to me, y'all, a literal last dance. So I'm going to pick up and I'm going to begin reading in Mark chapter six, and I'm going to even t tell you where the flashback starts. The Bible says, and King Herod heard of him for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. So let me give you some backstory of what's taking place here. Uh, Jesus has been doing all of these great miracles. He has raised Jairus' daughter. He has uh, preached the concept of the mustard seed faith. Uh, uh, in this context, he's going to feed the 5,000. And people are literally wondering, who is this cat? Who is this dude that's doing all of this crazy stuff, right? So dig it. The Bible has picks up with Herod um, literally saying, this is John the Baptist raised from the dead, which also gives you a kind of a cue as to the closeness that John and Herod shared. So the Bible has Herod saying, oh no, this is definitely John the Baptist who has raised from the dead and, 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 and is doing all of these mighty works. Other people kind of chime in and say, no, 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 this is Elias. And others said that it is a prophet, one of the prophets. It's, it's a prophet. And Herod is insistent. Herod heard it and he said, it is John whom I beheaded. For Herod himself sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her, for John has said unto Herod. And that's where the flashback happens. If this were a movie, that's where you would get the blue or that you would get the sepia tone or you'd get the person wistfully staring off into the distance because now the moment we see that word for, the for introduces the flashback. And this flashback picks up with Herod first saying, listen, whoever this person is that's doing all of these mighty works, it has to be John the Baptist raised from the dead. And then he goes into telling the story of how John the Baptist was killed. And here is that story. It says that um, uh, for Herod feared John. I want you to take take note of the fact that it says he feared John, um, knowing that he was a just or a holy or a righteous man um, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Don't miss that point right there, that the Bible just told us that this story of Herod 
and John, John, who is beheaded by Herod, it literally says that Herod used to listen to John preach. And he didn't just listen to him like, oh, I don't like what he's saying. The Bible literally just said he listened to him gladly, which would also help us understand that he didn't just hear him once. He heard him multiple times or he would make sure to hear him whenever he was in town preaching. He was like, whoever your favorite preacher is or whoever your favorite artist is, Beyonce has come to town. I'm going to give me some front row seats. I'm going to make sure I'm there because I like how she performs or I like how he preaches or I like what he has to say. And that's literally what we see the text telling us right here is that Herod actually enjoyed the preaching of John. Let's continue to read. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee, when the daughter of the, uh, of, of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, ask me whatever you want and I'm going to give you. Now, I want to stop here and interject this point. Understand this is another aspect of the relationship between John and Herod. Another aspect of the relationship between John and Herod. Because Herod enjoyed John's preaching, uh, he listened to a lot of stuff that he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Including you going to hell for having another man's wife. But now his wife, Herodias, heard that and she wasn't feeling John. She literally wanted John killed. But Herod, again, because of the relationship, because of the relationship between him and John, he protected John from his wife. His wife wanted him dead, but he was like, nah, I kind of feel John. John, my dude. I listened. I mean, like we ain't hanging out, but he's one of my favorite preachers. And so the Bible says, here comes this time where Herod is throwing this big gala. I mean, heads of state, senators, police chiefs, sheriffs, the whole nine yard. They're all there. They're all like digging it. Like, okay, what's going on? And then he says, listen, I got a special treat for y'all. Have Salome come in and dance. Now you got to understand context. In this time in the Jewish um in the Jew in Jewish history, for a woman to dance in public uh was already crazy. But for her to dance in public alone was definitely to a mixed audience of men and women was definitely a no-no. It was borderline prostitution meets pornography. Y'all don't hear me. It was borderline prostitution meets pornography. So this is already something inappropriate, which is why the stakes are so high that when he says, now that you dance for me, ask anything and I'm going to give it to you because you could have potentially compromised your standing, your public standing. You could have compromised your ability to get a husband. You could have compromised people's view of you. And so because you have done this thing at my party, I want you to tell me whatever it is that you want and I'm going to give that to you. Now, mind you, Salome is not really Herod's daughter. It's Herodias' daughter. And she's already prompted Salome for what she's supposed to ask for in this moment. And what do you think she asked for? Huh? Tell me. Tell me quickly. Hurry up. I can hear you. No, I can't. So let me tell you what she asked for. She asked for John's head on a silver platter. This is probably almost the origi origin of that whole concept of I'm going to have your head on a silver platter. Herodias has already prompted and prepared Salome that when he asks you, because she knows this could potentially compromise Salome's public standing, that when Herod asks, what do you want for this dance? Herodias has prompted Salome to say, I want John's head on a charger. Here it is right here in the text. The Bible says, he swore unto her, whatever you ask of me, I'm going to give it to you unto the half of my kingdom. Good God almighty. And she went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Now the story of Matthew says this was something that they had pre-discussed, but here it says, she asked her mother, what do you want me to ask for? And her mom says, I want the head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste. I love in, in the book of Mark, whenever that word straightway is used, it's literally like the moment that constitutes a nanosecond. But it adds to this straightway. And it says straightway with haste. She came to the king and asked saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. Now watch this. Here again comes this very interesting relationship between Herod and John. Notice what the text says in verse 26. And the king 
was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes, which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded John's head to be brought. And he went in and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel and the damsel gave it to her mother. So dig it. We like are literally <laughs> at a party and at this party, first of all, you just had this pornographic dance. Boom. She came in. I can imagine her belly dancing. Uh, uh, stop. Stop. This is church. Quit acting like that. So she came in, boom. She did her little dance, whatever. It's already gotten a little interesting because she then came in and done something that typically you don't do in public. But I mean, the stakes just got lifted past the roof because now she has asked for John's head on a silver platter. And everybody's now looking like, yo, what is Herod going to do? He just gave his word. What is his word worth? Can I just stop for a moment and tell you, like, dig it. Sometimes when you give your word, you might want to you might want to stop and think about what you're giving your word to, right? Right? You might want to stop and make sure that you're not being impulsive, but that you're being intentional. Because here's the thing, when we're impulsive, we get ourselves into situations that we will regret later, and that's what we're seeing here about hair. We're going to get a little bit deeper into this concept of regret. But what Herod is feeling is regret. He's even telling this story out of fear and out of regret. He hears all of this stuff about Jesus. And, and I believe that there is a hint of hope in his wanting it to be John having come back from the dead because he regrets the situation that he got himself into by giving his word. And, and so I want to tell us today, this is the first thing I want to tell us today. Get this. Do not miss this. If you can, write it down. I want you to, instead of succumbing to impulsiveness, insist on intentionality. Instead of succumbing to impulsiveness, insist on intentionality. Stop for a moment. You're in no rush, specifically now that we're in COVID-19, you sitting in your living room. You don't gotta be impulsive. You gotta get up and run and do nothing. You don't have, really, we don't have nothing to do, right? And so when we get back out there into the world, when we move into the next stage and the state is open and the country is open, this may be a good time that God has just pressed pause on some of the things you do because you are able to now recognize you've made a lot of decisions off of impulsiveness. You've made a lot of snap decisions. You've made a lot of decisions in the moment. You've made a lot of decisions like Herod because people were watching and you're found, you found yourself wanting to please the crowd. So what I want to just deposit in somebody's spirit that we learned from the story of Herod is this, and don't miss it. I'm going to say it very slowly in a couple of times so you could write it down. Instead of impulsiveness, insist on intentionality. Be intentional. And in order to be intentional, you have to put some thought into that stuff. You can't be doing things on a whim. You can't be doing things on the fly. You can't be doing things just because they feel good because everything that feels good is not good. Everything that feels right is not righteous. And so we need to take some time to stop and think and be a little bit more intentional as opposed to being so impulsive. And COVID-19 may have, again, pressed pause on some of the things you were doing because it gives you an opportunity to reflect on what you were doing so that you can make decisions moving forward, not to be impulsive, but instead to be intentional. Because when you're impulsive, you get yourself into situations, maybe not as stark and not as dire, but you get yourself into similar situations like Harry got himself in. Here he is literally having given the head of somebody he liked listening to on a silver platter in front of other people. They're at a party. The stakes just shot through the roof. It was one thing to watch this girl do this dance. It's a completely different thing for him to command somebody to go out, chop off someone's head, and then bring that head back into a charger. So you're wondering probably what is a charger? A charge is that platter that then has the thing on the, that you can cover and uncover. Well, well, that's literally what they did. They brought in the head in this charger, boom, uncover it. She sees, I can imagine she freaked out. Like who wants to see a severed head in a party? She gives it to the mom. The mom is boom. Oh my gosh, I got the head on a charger. But here's the point of this story. 
is that Herod is caught in a season of regret, a season of regret. And as we're in this series called The Last Dance, and, and, and we're having to think about to ourselves, like, what if 2020 was our last year? What if this month, the month of May, was our last month? What is this day, May 9th, was our last day? What if this was our last dance? And, and it's very interesting to me as I look at the story, one of the things I alluded to earlier about um, funny, not in the sense of being like comedic, but just interesting that John's life is decided on a dance. This text literally records the last dance of John's life. John loses his head. He loses his life over a dance. And at this party, they bring the head of a prophet into the room. And I'm sure it freaks everybody out. No one more so than Herod. Why? Because the text already told us that Herod actually liked listening to John. He actually liked listening to John. But because of his impulsiveness, he has now caused the death of John. Not only that, he had protected John from Herodias up to this point, and his impulsiveness has gotten him into a situation where he is now no longer able to protect his favorite preacher, someone he liked hearing from his wife's wrath. She has ultimately prevailed because she has been able to maneuver in such a way that Herod has in, in being impulsive has now lost his ability to protect John. The Bible tells us that John not only, I mean, that Herod not only liked hearing John, notice the text says in verse 20 that Herod feared, but the Greek word there is all. He respected John. He not only liked hearing John, he respected John. Not only that, the Bible says he knew that John was a holy and a righteous man. He knew that John was a holy and a righteous man, but his impulsiveness, his impulsiveness, which is again why I want you to, instead of impulsiveness, insist on intentionality, his impulsiveness has saw him unable to protect some someone he had been protecting. It saw him killing a person he respected and revered. It saw him executing a person he actually enjoyed listening to. And now when you get down to verse 26, the Bible says he was exceeding sorry, but he did it for his oath's sake. Now I want to draw your attention to this concept here in verse 26 of exceeding sorry. Do you know what this word is? This is the exact same emotion Jesus feels when he moves into the garden of Gethsemane. And I submit to you that as Jesus is moving into the garden of Gethsemane, what Jesus is feeling is the collective weight of the sin of the present, the collective weight of the sin of the future, and the collective weight of the sin of the past. Jesus is walking walking into Gethsemane and he is being crushed under the collective weight of, of sin of humanity from past, present to future. And that causes him to be exceeding sorrowful. Now, I want you to translate this now. I want you to translate this into the fact that what Herod is feeling is not because of someone else's sin. It's not because of the sin of the present. It's not because of the sin of the future. No, it is the sin that he has committed against his very own consciousness. And that's what impulsiveness does to us. It causes us to commit sins against our own conscious, things we know we have no business doing, places we have no business going, people we have no business being around. But impulsiveness causes us to do things against our own consciousness. And later on, we're looking back with regret. And so here we find Herod looking back with regret because he has done something that he is exceeding sorrowful. Even in the moment, in the moment, he realizes he has just gotten himself into a situation he doesn't want to get into. And if we're honest, the moment we find ourselves succumbing to peer pressure, the moment we find ourselves doing something, smoking something, drinking something, going somewhere that we know we should not be doing, as we take that first hit, we're sorry. As we take that first drink, we're sorry. As we do that first thing, we're sorry. And then we look back later and we're saying, oh my goodness, why did I do that? And like Herod, we are looking back with regret. 
We're exceeding sorrowful to the extent that Jesus was when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. The emotion that Herod is feeling can only be likened unto what Jesus experienced when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And many of us, many of us, many of us, many of us carry the exact same weight on us because of impulsiveness. And here's what impulsiveness does. And here's where it is born out of. Here's what happens. It's not okay to let the opinion of others overrule your morals. It is not okay to let the opinions of others overrule our morals. And that's exactly what Herod does here. The Bible says he was exceeding sorrow, yet for his oath's sake, he did it. Listen, why, why, I, hmm, let me say this a nice way. You got to realize when you're giving your word to people who you shouldn't be giving your word to. Even the Bible says, don't put your pearls before swine, because when you do that, all they do is trample them. They don't appreciate the precious nature of pearls. Did you hear what I said? If you did, go ahead and say, amen. I heard you. No, I didn't. Well, I'm going to pretend I did. If you heard it, say, amen. Listen, don't cast your pearls before swine because when you cast your pearls before swine, they don't value it the way you do. And oftentimes we can give our word to people because we are people of morals. We are people with ethics. We are people with principles. We are people with values, but we're giving our word to people who have no principles, no values, and maybe no morals or ethics. And we feel like we have to maintain our word to those people. And I will submit to you that on some occasions, yeah, you should, but on other occasions, it's okay to just say, you know what? I've changed my mind. There's nothing wrong with coming to your senses and saying, I've changed my mind because I know it's not okay to let the opinions of others overrule my morals, overrule my ethics, overrule my principles, overrule what I know to do and to be right. There is no excuse and God accepts no excuse for sin. Now he does offer forgiveness for sin, but there is no excuse for sin. And so here we find Herod overcome with regret because he is doing something that violates his own conscience. All right, so look, now I want to shift to a person. I want to shift from Herod to a person who would rather be without a head than be without a conscience. And that was John the Baptist. That's right. A person who would rather be without their head than be without a conscience. And that's John the Baptist. So while we're in this flashback, if you will, this montage, this flashback of Herod remembering when he took John's life, I want to go back in that flashback to another flashback to kind of fill in some more critical information and kind of solve a mystery if you will. So we're flashing back to John is in prison. You may have heard this story before, but while John is in prison, what he does is he calls his disciples, man. He's kind of tripping out because he's been in jail for about 18 months. Now, if you want to look at this, it's over in Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, it's the same story because again, when we're looking at Matthew, Luke, and Mark, these are called the synoptic gospels. They are the individual's take on the events that comprise the life of Christ. And that's why they're called the gospel according to. But the reason we theologians call them synoptics is just a fancy word of saying they're the same. They cover some of the same information, some of the same story. Like John doesn't tell this story of, uh, of John the Baptist at all. Although he does fill in some very critical information about John that I, I don't want to discuss today, but I, cause I, I, I kind of want to get to this point right here that about a little bit earlier in our flashback of Herod flashing back, we're flashing back to this time that John is in jail. And he's been in jail now for about 18 months. And, and he's growing concerned because he's already done the whole, hey, I baptized him and I'm not worthy to unlatch his satchel. I mean, unlatch the, the sandals on his feet thing. He, he He's done the whole, uh, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. As a matter of fact, if you look at that story, John tells this story that there is a day when John sees Jesus walking toward him and he thinks, boom, this is it. Ready, set, go. Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And 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 Jesus just kind of 
keep keeps on rolling, right? He just keeps on ro rolling. So so this is this is kind of weird for John, but 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 in this particular story, John has already done all of that. John has already done the baptizing. He's already declared him. He's already said it, and he's been waiting for 18 months. And now he's not been waiting for 18 months at home like you have under quarantine or self-isolation. He's now waiting in imposed isolation in jail and wondering why hasn't Jesus done the thing? Why hasn't Jesus liberated Israel? Why hasn't Jesus ushered in the kingdom? Why hasn't Jesus baptized the world with fire? Why hasn't Jesus done any of those things that John had been prophesying and testifying and witnessing to that Jesus would do when he arrived? So he's sitting there in jail. He's been there for about 18 months. And, and, and I can imagine he's probably had enough. So he sees his disciples, they've come to, 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 to visit him, and he says, hey, look, man, I need y'all to go ask him straight out. I'm tired of all the games. Just ask him, are you the one or should we look for another? Now, what you don't know, what John doesn't know, what the disciples don't know, but I'm sure Jesus knew, these would literally be John's last words to Jesus. Th th this, this was... John's last dance with Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to fast forward back to the point where he loses his head in the dance of Salome, but this is the last interaction between John and Jesus. And that interaction is, man, are you the one? Why aren't you doing the thing? Why, 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 why hasn't fire raining down? Why, why hasn't uh, Rome been deposed? Why, why, why aren't you doing the thing? His last words to Jesus should be words that fill him with regret. He doesn't know this. He doesn't know that this day, this opportunity, this time that he talks to Jesus will literally be the last time he's able to say anything to Jesus. And what he expresses is disappointment in Jesus. Are you the one? Like, why haven't you done it? What's going on? Ask, ask him, ask him. So the disciples roll up on Jesus. Jesus is in the middle of doing his Jesus thing, right? Right. He's doing Jesus stuff. And they say, hey, man, look, yo, John asks us to ask you, are you the one or should we look for another? And, and Jesus says, hey, go tell John what you see. You see the, the sick being healed. You see the lame walking again. You see the blind seen again. T tell them all the stuff you see. And, and while John, watch this, watch this, while John has expressed disappointment in Jesus, the crowd Jesus anticipates is expressing some disappointment in John because Jesus is doing, as far as they're concerned, the Jesus thing, right? He's healing them. He's, he's feeding them. He's uh, restoring their sight. He's, he's just being an amazing person prophet, an amazing leader, an amazing representation of who and what God is. And John has just now expressed disappointment. And so they feel that John, watch this, should also regret asking that question. And I believe that while John didn't know those were his last words, while, while we, if we had read that story, wouldn't have known those were John's last words, Jesus, Jesus knew that would be their final interaction. And so I want you to notice that Jesus then turns to the crowd anticipating their disappointment and John asking this question and he begins to roll, man. He begins to straight up roll. Here is where he says, John is the greatest disciple, I mean, the greatest prophet born from a woman. John is this, John is that, John is the, oh man, I mean, he just starts giving John all of these compliments. He gives John all of these compliments because here is, and here is what I think John's last words and last thoughts would be, just like what I want my last thoughts to be. You know, we often hear this concept of, you know, when you die, your life will flash before your eyes. But I believe that in this moment, when John died, when John died, what flashed before John's eyes wasn't his life. What flashed before his eyes is what I want to flash before my eyes. And that is the life of Jesus. Listen, if you get to the last dance, the last moment, the last day, the last month, the last week, and your life is flashing before your eyes, you've missed it. 
But if you get to the last dance, the last week, the last moment, the last day, and it is the life of Jesus that flashed before your eyes, you've got it. You've hit the mark. You've realized that there is now no reason to regret. And here is what I want to deposit in your spirits because Jesus says this of John, and this is what I love. This is the point I love. And it's so much different from what we see with Herod. Jesus literally says, and you may have heard somebody quote this text before, but it's in the context of him building up, of him affirming John that he says, look, it's right here in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, it's okay that John doubted. It's okay that John asked me these questions. I don't mind that he has some questions. I don't mind that he wants some answers because he brought those questions to me. He brought those questions to me. And now that I'm answering them, you got to understand it's okay. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. You can rattle the kingdom all you want. All that is going to shake out is the answer, particularly when you live your life for Jesus. So here's what you do with regret. Here's what you do with regret. You first acknowledge the regret. I believe that John probably did regret at some point and to some degree, but he acknowledged that regret. And not only did he acknowledge that regret, he identified the source of that regret. He knew what he had been born to do. He knew that what his job was, was to herald the advent of Jesus Christ. He knew that he wasn't worthy to unloose the, the sandals from Jesus' feet. And so he acknowledged that regret and he even identified the source of that regret. But guess what? I believe he even moved past that regret. And in this flashback moment, I, I, I see us picking up on Jesus, affirming John like no other. And so when you've made some decisions, when you've made some moves, we don't need to wallow in that thing like Herod did. What we need to do is we need to acknowledge that regret because there are some benefits to sitting back and saying, hey, Hey, what was I thinking there? Why did I do that? But the problem is when you stay there, when you acknowledge that regret and identify the source of that regret, and you are able to move on knowing that Jesus has come. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter nine, to purge our conscience from dead works. If you've accepted Jesus into your life as your personal savior, Jesus is literally going through your database and he will remove the moments that you are not happy about, that you are not proud about. Jesus has the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to superimpose his life on your life so that all you will see when your life flashes before your eyes is the birth of Jesus. All you will see when your life flashes before your eyes at the end of it is the life of Jesus. All you will see when your life flashes before your eyes at the end of it is the ministry of Jesus. All you will see when your life flashes before your eyes at the end of it is the death of Jesus. All you will see at the end of your life when your life flashes before your eyes is the resurrection of Jesus. Because if you give your life to Christ, unlike Herod did, that regret won't ruin you. Because if your heart condemns you, the Bible says, one greater than your heart has come and that person is Jesus. And so don't live a life of regret. Acknowledge the regret. Identify the source of regret and then move past the regret and hear Jesus say of you, you are my beloved child in whom I am well please because what is the testimony of your life when you come to the end of it what will flash before your eyes the mystery will finally be unveiled and that mystery is how did Jesus save a wretch like me you won't be exceedingly sorrowful like Herod would was but you will instead be exceedingly joyful as Jesus is and he will rejoice over you the Bible says with singing because you acknowledge you identify, but you move past it. And so when your life flashes before your eyes, the last thing you wanna see is not your life, it's not your regrets, not your problems, not your, your down moments, not, 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 not your depressed moments, not even this COVID-19 moment. What you wanna see is that you learn from those things and you learn that Jesus was able to pull you through those things and that you consistently and continually rededicated and dedicated your life, your seconds, your minutes, your hours, your weeks, your days to Jesus. And so that when you finally have that last flashback, what flashes before your eyes is the life of Jesus. And I believe that is one of the most significant differences between Herod and John, is that when he looked back at taking the life of John, 
he regretted it because he never gave that thing to Jesus. But when Jesus, and when John, excuse me, looked back at his life and that moment that he questioned Jesus, he surrendered that thing to Jesus. And what flashed before his eyes, I'm almost certain, before that man took his hand, was the life of not just his cousin, not of a person that he baptized, but of his Lord and his Savior, Jesus Christ. And in that flashback, what flashed before John's eyes was not his life, but the life of Jesus. That is the flashback I want for me, and that is the flashback I want for you. That is the line of demarcation between John and Herod. Actually, while there are many differences and contrasts between Herod and John, this one, I pray that as we enter into this season of contemplating what could be our last dance, we desire the last thing we see to be the life of Christ. And if that's your prayer, what I want to do is invite you even now to pray with us that Jesus would come into your life and live his life out fully in yours. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of Christ. Thank you for the Bible that contains this wonderful, wonderful story of how Jesus lived, bled, died for us and desires to give us his life that we would be new creatures in him. So let us all to that end accept Christ as our personal savior, as our Lord, that when we come to those final moments, we have a flashback of the moment we accepted him and every moment that he lived his life fully out in and through us. This is our prayer. This is our plea. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Hey, listen. Thank you for joining us uh, this week. Uh, come back next week where we will be into our third installment of The Last Dance. Glad you were able to flash back with us. But if you're wondering, how do you become a part of what we're doing here at the Mount Rubido Church? You're already on the page. Go over, sign up for one of our groups. We have prayer groups, we have Bible study groups, anything you might need during this season of COVID-19 to spiritually enrich and feed your family. So again, go to the groups page, Sign up for next steps. Sign your kids up for Bible time with the kids. Just sign up and be a part of what we're doing here. We would love to have you. God bless you.